I'm excited to introduce the most anticipated webinar slash podcast that we've ever done. And this is one with Ron Carruthers on college financing strategy. Just like with taxes, there's a whole world of strategies that you can do to build wealth in a tax advantaged manner, to fund your children's education, but not only to finance it, but also to minimize the amount of tuition that your children pay to the universities. Just like with taxes, there are all sorts of actions that we can perform. So not only do we have savings available, but we can also minimize the amount that they have to pay and maximize the amount of assistance they can get from the universities through some thoughtful planning and entity structuring and understanding the FAFSA code, which is similar to the tax code, not nearly as complicated, but there's lots of opportunities in it. Stay tuned and subscribe if you want to hear more great information. And if you are interested in either being a client or you know someone who wants to join the team, email info at markperlbertcpa.com. So welcome everybody. I am so excited to hear, here to have a most anticipated guest speaker, Ron Carruthers. I, I've been listening to Ron for some time now and he knows his stuff when it comes to college financial planning and you'd be surprised by all of the myths out there and all of the uh, missed opportunities that people miss out on because they just don't understand how this system works and Ron has taken the time to really dive into the nitty gritty. And he's gonna give us some wonderful insight on on co- planning for financing your children's college. So Ron, take it away. Can you introduce yourself in 60 seconds or less to the audience? Yeah, so real easily. I was 30, well, we won't even get into how many years ago because it's depressing. I was my high school's valedictorian in California. I'm um, native Californian. Um, And we didn't have any money for me to get to college. So I didn't go right away, but I was number one in my class. So I went later to be a um, CPA as well as a certified financial planner. And about midway through those programs, I tripped over the college roles. And I've kind of been lecturing on these ever since. So really the premise of what you guys are going to learn tonight is as fast as I can get it to you, then you can reach out to Mark Taft questions afterwards is, how to pay the least amount of money possible for college to the best school your kids can get into with the most amount of grants and scholarships, free money, not loans, although they're sometimes part of the equation, no matter how much money you make, how good of a student you have or what you've already saved for college. That's really the formula that kind of goes along with that is what we're going to be talking about. And I got slides. I can share them, Mark. I can just chat through it. Whatever you guys want, man. I am a man of the budget. Let's what I would like you to do go through the slides and I'm gonna chime in here and there and, and talk about how this kind of fits into what some of our clients are doing. Most of our clients are real estate investors. Uh the people that we have, we got a lot of folks. Well, some of the folks uh, are not my clients, but a lot of people that we get are people who have W twos in real estate investments or oh, well, full time entrepreneurs. Love it. Love it. Hey, make me um make me host again. I give it back to you so you can switch those settings. But if you make me host, then I can share my screen. If I can share my screen, I can show you what I want to show for it. And then just so you guys know, this is a presentation that I give live. And it's a little easier to do live than online. So I'm gonna skip some screens that just aren't necessarily relevant to you guys. So keep this thing moving right along. Uh, we jokingly call this, hold on, let me get this to work, how to get money for college without going broke, selling kidneys, any of those sorts of things. And then I'll tell you guys what this is right now. I'm going to give you guys a framework for how the system works. What I can't give you is how it works for you. And when you're done, just reach out to Mark. So you guys should already have his contact information. And just to be clear with the Oprah, we are talking about free stuff, not loans. Although again, they're a part of the equation. 
And if you guys aren't clients of Mark, I'll sit here for a moment and let you guys um just screenshot this. And by the way, you guys can take pictures of anything. You know, just make sure if you post it, like don't get me looking weird, you know, with one eye like that. Ah, come on, be cool. But but feel free to take pictures of any of this. Um, and here's the reality. Just if you guys are like, we didn't really save that much for college. This is a CNBC number from a few years ago that the average family has enough saved for one of their kids to go for half of a year. And the debt clock, have you ever shown these guys the debt clock before, Mark? Uh, no, I haven't. This is cool. So if you go to, if you go to usdebtclock.org, it tracks the national debt. By the way, this is from like three years ago. The national debt was 20000 <laughs> I mean, 20 trillion, it's 31 trillion now, but they track on there. They took it away for a while and then they brought it back. College debt as well as credit card debt and mortgage debt. And at the time, again, back when the debt was to a third less, student loan was about 1.6 trillion with a T and credit card debt was only, only quote unquote a trillion. And just to give you guys some perspective of that, because Congress throws around numbers, you know, and throws this stuff around like it's water. If you spent a dollar a second, you know, so like one, two, three, four, 24 seven in a day, you would spend $86,400. That's how many seconds there are in a day. In a year, you would spend $31 million. I'll give you guys a second, just see if you can guess. You're welcome to post in the chats. How far back would you have to go before you spent $1 trillion? Not 31, not 1.6, just one. You guys want to take a guess on that? It's 29,000 years before christ so i got one person playing along michael that's a really common answer is like yeah like i don't know a couple hundred years that's why when they throw this math around it does that mean anything to us and yet it's it's kind of a big deal senior citizens owe a bunch of money um oh there's a pardon they're, they're the worst now this is me going a little off topic here but we're probably going to do a separate discussion on financial planning of children for their baby boomer parents who didn't save up for their retirement because that is a huge issue that not a lot of people are talking about and there are going to be some financial instruments and life insurance products where we can actually still take advantage of some strategy here to support our parents as they reach retirement but sorry let's continue no please inter interrupt so what we're going to talk about is basically one thing. It's a formula. It's five steps and a half to the formula. Um, actually, five steps and two half. And I'm going to blast through this in like 45 minutes, only out of respect for Mark being a New Yorker. And this is harder to do online than it is, you know, in a thing. But basically, what we're going to show you is how do you get that great education, top school, and pay less than what your neighbors did, which means you can blow the money, you can be thrifty and save it for retirement. And then just so you know, that's the baby giant. Um, That's my middle kid. That's his little sister right there. He graduated Northeastern in 2018, totally debt-free. And he's at UT Law right now um, in his second semester of his first year, basically debt-free. They're paying for almost everything. Now, the for, by the way, the formulas are different between um, undergraduate and graduate. We're going to focus on undergraduate, but there is a different formula for graduate school. Um, my oldest went to human, um, USC for basically just the cost of room and board. That's her husband. Um, that's her actual award there. And then the baby gra just graduated Berkeley. And the little asterisk there, she went for the cost of the food because... She's a vegan and somehow that costs more than the other kids did. I can't figure that out. So we're going to go over this formula. I already told you guys who I was. I've been, they 
do a bunch of news stuff. They always put me with the skinniest person they can find, which always makes me mad. All right, here's what we're going to be covering. We're going to focus 100% on college. So we're not going to be talking about life insurance. We're not going to be talking about anything. We're not going to be talking about generic financial planning, except in the very abstract in one point. What we are going to show you is what steps should you be taking right now to pay the least for college. And the reason this is a big deal is number one, despite what the Biden administration tried to do last year with forgiving some of the student loan debt, I think that's dead in the water. The Supreme Court's going to decide it, so it doesn't really matter what I think. But at the end of the day, a lot of the planning that people are taught doesn't help this situation. The loans get really expensive, although there are different formulas for paying them back that can be advantageous. 529s can often hurt you more than they help you. And so what we're going to try to walk you through is how do you actually do this so it benefits your kid? Um, and we don't need this. This is what we need. And these are the five steps, and I'll cover the two half steps well, before we finish. We are going to be discussing what the financial aid rulebook is that you need to know and where you find it. We're going to talk about the three questions that you have to get answered from every school. We are going to show you the one financial planning step that you need to take in the middle of all this. Then we'll talk about filing the forms, which is where most people start, and we will define what does it mean to file them accurately, what does it mean to file them on time, and then we'll talk about how to negotiate with schools when it's appropriate, and we just have someone do it against advice inappropriately and it costs some money so and by the way i'll give you one last thing step number one takes all the time for me to explain so if we're sitting here and you're like oh my god it's been going on for like ever on this are we ever going to get on here 100 percent, you are um but this one takes a little longer so here's what you need to know congress made these rules now if you guys are red or blue or kind of hate everybody um we can all agree like Congress is fairly dysfunctional. So they created this, this guide. It's 847 pages long, which of course, if you say it to a CPA, they laugh. They're like, get out of here. That's like the intro to the tax code, which is, you know, a hundred times that long, but it's still confusing with wither twos and here fours. And, you know, if subsection B applies, go to subsection D. If it doesn't go to subsection E, just like, all kinds of crazy stuff. But what they've come up with is a formula that they use to determine what you can afford as a parent. And if you print that formula out, actually I need to update this. It's now 30 pages long. They got rid of six pages. And it's not 30 pages of calculations, but it's 30 pages of stuff that doesn't always make a lot of sense. Like... If you put money in the 529, we're going to come over here and count it against you. And we're going to reward the person that didn't put the money there and punish you because you did it. Does that make any sense? No. But if you understand this, then you can apply the formula to your situation. And I liken it to tax planning. If you sit down and you read a couple articles on the internet and you're like, great, I'm going to do these couple things. You can save yourself some money. You get a pro involved or do a bunch of research, you can save a lot of money. And I'll make it really clear that we're doing this Warren Buffett's way. And what I mean is Warren Buffett famously said, I pay a lower tax rate than my secretary. You know, they think he said something like, well, that just doesn't seem right, which no, Warren Buffett goes and learns the code and has an army of CPAs. You don't need an army, but the point is there's a legitimate way. No one is like, he can't do that. He's doing something illegal. It's more like, hey, how can I be like him and do that? So when we get into this, what we are looking for is your expected family contribution. That's what the magic three letters stand for. And basically what happens is when you fill out this paperwork, it, it gets 
shout out in the cyberspace to each of the schools that you've applied to and that they applied their formula to it where they take the coa which is the full cost of attendance one year tuition and fees room and board walking around money all of that subtract your family contribution and the difference if there is one is your need doesn't mean that's what you're getting but it just means that's what the federal government is like. Okay, this is what you can afford. So if you lay out a public school, for instance, and this is not to say anything bad about public schools, but a lot of us are like, man, we can't afford a private school. Like those suckers are expensive. What happens is the public school if you have an EFC of 20000 they subtract that from their, again, not just the tuition, but the total cost of attendance. You have a need of $10,000. But a private school that's seventy or 80000 might feel like you have, you know, the same $20,000, so now your need gets higher. Again, that is not a guarantee that these guys are going to help you with this any more than these guys are going to help you with this. But this is what they're doing internally. So, of course, the first step is, what can we do to get this sucker as low as humanly possible? Because it's going to apply across the board. And that's where that handbook comes in. And that's where sitting down with someone like Mark to chat about it is like, okay, here's what's going on. And then he can at least give you some guidance on that. And that's one that like everybody's situation is different. But I will tell you, I have real estate investors client clients too. And in some cases, we have portfolios upwards of 10, 15, 20 million that we were able to exempt from the formula legally, morally, ethically, so it didn't count against them. So don't assume like, oh, I have too much money or I have, you know, this stuff. And don't necessarily be shy about picking a school that is more expensive because often once you understand the formula and figure out how it applies to you, that private school won't necessarily cost you more. Doesn't mean it's better. Doesn't mean you shouldn't look at public schools. It just means we can remove a lot of the math differential out of it. Mr. Perlberg, did you want to throw anything in? No, I think that we're good right now. But what, what's interesting here is that this is like, it's just like how we can do certain things. We're incentivized to do certain things to reduce our taxable income. Is there's this whole other formula here that we're looking at for to calculate the expected family contribution. And there are actions that you can take when you understand how the system works, just like how you understand the things that we're doing for our clients, how we understand how the internal revenue code works, that can really set people up for success. So lots of very similar concepts. And some of them, you know, some of our planning is going to focus on aligning this with all sorts of other strategies for reducing taxes and also potentially some entity structuring, asset protection, and estate planning, and wealth building all coming together. It all comes together. And if you spend less on college, it's more money to spend on real estate, Again, fast cars, you know, whatever you want to blow your cash on. So here's an example. You know, I live in Southern California. I'm 30 miles north of San Diego. We have Wolfway and Del Mar. And if you guys know all that, that's all, you know, high rent district. I live like two towns up from Del Mar. Um, but we have a client there. All her kids are grown. Um, in fact, she sent me a card recently. That's her. Anyway. They owned a $2 million home. And remind you, this was a few years ago. Now everything's $2 million here. But they also had a $2 million beachfront condo. And obviously, they made more than six figures. So all three of her kids went to private universities. They averaged $43,000 a year in free money. They were all top 100 ranked, no matter who ranked them. So again, these weren't like Bach School of Liberal Arts. It was, well, I'll show you. Wesleyan was where one kid went. One of the other kids went to Boston University. Yeah, Boston University. Her word letters like packed in storage. But she got about the same amount. So again, 
you met her, you'd be like, no way are you getting money. And she's like, yeah, actually I am. And here it is. And by the way, the younger kid, he went to Wash University in St. Louis. He got 43.9. So you may be like, yeah, there's no way a school is going to give me that kind of money. But the answer is they actually can. And if you do the, oh, Kyle, you know what? I lied to you. I'm one more town north. I'm in Carlsbad. So I'm technically three towns north. So I, and I, I, if you know Carl about it all, I used to live in La Costa with all the city people. Now I live in the village. So I like walked all the restaurants. You could see the ocean from my house, you know? So technically, yeah. Encinitas, Solana Beach, Curtis, technically Encinitas, and then it's still more so I'm three towns up. Um, anyway, glad, glad to know somebody knows where Encinitas and Carl's about are. Here's the summary for one kid. And most importantly, we avoided this payment. Now, the payment isn't as bad as it may sound, which I'll explain to you. It's one of the half things of the five. But if we go back, that was step number one. That's the part that takes me the longest to explain. Two, three, four, five, half, half will take super fast. But understand that the most important thing that I can beat into your head is I'm upper middle class. I don't come from money, but I work for my money. I had things my kids were able to go essentially for free. This lady, definitely upper middle class. Her kids were able to essentially go for free, three of them. And we didn't do anything but what I'm showing you. Now, obviously there's some subtleties to it, but this is worth money to you to pay attention. Okay, moving along to step number two. Know which schools have money. So there's three questions we want to ask about every school. So you remember we had our formula. We got cost of attendance, family contribution, need, and then we subtracted down and we went, okay, need. Now we got to find out what percentage of need do they meet? How much of it is free money? And for the average student, how long are they actually going to be going to college here? So here's a tale of two schools. I took the same two that we already saw. By the way, these are real numbers. I just rounded them. So the public school might meet, you have a need of 10,000 and they might be like, right, we'll help you with half of that. So we'll help you with 5,000 of it. That's the answer to question number one. Now, who pays the 5,000 that they didn't help, help you with? The answer is you or the kid. Somebody pays that, or grandma. Of the half they helped you with in this example, this is the answer to question number two, and here's number three. They held half in free money. So in a year, we get 2,500 free, which is better than nothing. Because a lot of parents that don't mess with any of this wouldn't got nothing. But you're still coming out with the majority of it out of pocket. Now we compare that to a private school that a lot of them meet 100% of need. Now, does every public school meet this little? No, some meet a lot more. Does every private school meet this much? No, some meet a lot less. It depends. But there are schools that will meet 80, 85, 90, 92, 95, 98% in free money. And a lot of those schools will gear, all but guarantee that your kid graduates in four years. So what the end result is, is the school gives away 46 of the 50, the parent out of pocket pays about 2,300 and it, I mean, 23,000. And if you're like, Ron, that's impossible. Be like, wait, I just showed you a lady, two of her kids where she was getting about that much money. And you're like, well, no way would the private school be cheaper than the public school. And it isn't always but it is often enough, or even when it's not less, it's close enough that you don't necessarily want to rule out the private schools. Does that make sense to you guys? You can just nod or type yes. So again, we can broaden the search to include private schools once we've figured out what your family contribution is. Then we can go research to make sure how much schools have money. Now I'll tell you something that happened this week. One, somebody that I trained in business was one of her students, you know, to do this. One of her students 
was getting like 48,000 a year from Northeastern, but 71,000 a year from Cornell. Now they turned around and the kid wants to get a Northeastern. My kid went to Northeastern, but if he'd have gotten into Cornell or gotten more money, his ass would have been going to Cornell. And so we're like, again, I could have told them that up front based on research right here. I think my, my, my person actually told them that they just didn't listen because they want their kid to row. And what I would be trying to explain to them is you're paying 25,000 a year, essentially to row. I'll give you five to not row and you go to Cornell. So that's why we researched this right on the front end. Um, moving right along. By the way, this just does the math is like, by the way, if you figure six years at a higher amount versus four years at a lower amount, the difference can be very disparate. And for a lot of you all that are real estate investors, kind of middle class, upper middle class, this is the rule, not the exception of the rule. I have hundreds of clients that it's worked out this way for that never would have thought to even apply had they not known what we taught them. So. Yeah, it can work out. Here's your first two steps. Now, the third step is is kind of like for a lot of people, it's a reality check because they really don't know where they're at for retirement. They really don't know. They didn't save for college. So I won't bore you guys with this, but there's a very important phrase that I'll give you, which is you want to make sure that you fund with cash your future. And if money's tight, take care of that first, then finance their education. So get, we'll get as much aid as can, but there's always going to be a gap left over. And if we need to finance it, it's not as bad as you might think because the formula is very favorable to you where you're allowed, you can make good money, borrow a lot, and then make a very small payment for a certain number of years and the government forgives the rest. It's another way of helping pay for college. And unlike kind of what Biden did last summer where they were like, oh, we're just gonna forgive this 10 or 20,000. This has been passed by Congress. It's been around a while. Most people don't even know there's one formula, let alone seven. So you always wanna take care of your retirement stuff first because no one's gonna lend you money for that. Take care of your investments, your wealth strategies, your trust, and then finance the education. And and like I said, I'll we can mark if you want, we'll do a whole other class just on all the different ways that you can legally minimize what you pay on these loans and then eventually have them just canceled out. Um mm -hmm. again, we we recommend that you go the borrowing strategy for the difference rather than burning income or assets, unless they're 529s, which you may you know, depending on your situation, may not even want to keep, even if you have a tax hit, but don't do that on your own. Get some advice on that. Um, and I just, this was an example of where we cash flowed some money and got some tax savings, ended up saving the family about a hundred grand, just in interest and fees and taxes. And then we're like, hey, they were able to put that aside and it'd be very low interest rate. It would have grown to 300,000 because they were a fairly young family. So a lot of people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to skip that. No, this is a really important part of the step. Okay. Step number four. I told you that steps two, three, and four go fast. You want to fill your paperwork out accurately and on time. So let's define those. First of all, accurately means that we're not lying to them. Okay. These are federal formulas the penalties can be severe for straight up lying. But the government gives us goofy definitions. So if we plan ahead the way Warren Buffett would do to exempt real estate, exempt business cash, exempt personal cash, exempt certain things, lower income, then we end up with a much lower ESC, but we're playing within the rules. We're not trying to cheat the system like Felicity Huffman and Lori Laughlin did, which is why I put their pictures up there. So that's what it means. We're not lying. We're just planning ahead so that our burden is the least amount possible. And we give the colleges an excuse to give us the most amount of money. 
And this is a huge area that parents don't strategize for, but then when they actually sit down and fill up the forms, not only do they not strategize, they screw up the paperwork, which the main one is called the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Four out of five of those go in with major errors on them. The second one is the CSS profile that some of the private schools want. Um, and that has even more room for error. The three biggest mistakes, whoops, we'll go right back there, are if you roll money over, if you're not careful, they'll count that as income. If you are in a divorced or were never married situation, which happens, there's specific rules on who you count and who you don't count. Often that can be used to your favor. And by far the biggest one is people write stuff down that they weren't supposed to include. So their assets get all screwed up. They list home equity, retirement accounts, none of those count for the FAFSA. So just be really, really careful there. And by the way, if any of you are listening to this, and you're like, ooh, I think I made a mistake. You can go in and download the paperwork, get it over to Mark, he'll review it for you. Get it to me if Mark's busy, I'll review it for you. And then um, if you made a mistake, it's super easy to go in and fix. The problem is, is if you never check it, then it becomes a big deal. Um, are you guys learning stuff? You guys enjoying this? Um, if you have questions, please drop them in. You know, I'm going through, I'm shotgunning through this, but if you guys have questions or want me to back up on some, more than happy to do it. Uh, then we'll chat about what does, okay, Michael says loving it. Good. Um, I am glad to hear it. Michael, uh, Mark, note that he liked, he loved it. Actually, it's moving back. Uh, okay, what does untying mean? So you're going to, the answer that I'm going to give you is different than what you guys think. Because what y'all think I'm going to say is as soon as possible, and that is absolutely not true. So here is your answer. And by the way, scratch that both. No later than the end of January of the year that your student goes to college. So if you guys have juniors right now, you'd be filing it next January at the latest. If you have seniors, you're late. Or the next time is um, whenever the school tells you it's due. So some schools have earlier deadlines. What you don't want to do is file it on October 1st when the form goes live. And let me tell you why. Um, the Obama administration back in the early 2010s got frustrated actually because not enough people were taking student loans. Not enough people were getting Pell Grants. And the government, when you pay interest on those student debts, granted, they can forgive them, but they will also turn around and they will, um, they're the ones collecting the interest on it. So they came in and solved a problem, a real problem, but also a fake problem at the same time. So what they did is they went, well, the reason we think more people aren't filling these out it never occurred to them, the form sucks. It's a really hard form to do. They're like, oh, people don't have their taxes done yet. So let them use the year before's information. And while we're at it, we'll let everybody, we'll open up the form three months earlier so they can file it on October 1st. The problem is it's the federal government and they don't like to allocate money to the Department of Education and they certainly don't like to allocate it to the computer programmers. So what they do is they push the system live every October 1st with minimal beta testing and it changes every year. So what they do instead is watch it break in real time and then try to go in and fix it. So to us, unless we have a student that's an athlete or an early decision or something where it has to be done in October, we consider October amateur month. We're gonna sit that whole thing out and then we start filling in our clients form forms on November. So there's actually an advantage because you can submit information in October. It can track wrong because the system's broken and you have no idea unless you're like, wait, I knew my EFC was supposed to be 10,000 and it's 30. What happened? Oh, the system rerouted your data into the wrong column. So be really careful on that. Again, we want to lower the EFC, pick schools that have money, have a plan to pay your share, 
turn around and uh, fill the forms accurately and on time. And then lastly, oh, here's a simple, this guy wasn't even the winner. Here's a case study. They were making quarter of a million. This was the great kind of, um, I don't know what we called it back in 2008. It's like the great recession. I don't know. But they made a mistake and counted home equity and retirement plans and a business they hadn't even started yet. So they told the school they had $800,000 more. And remember, this was back in 2008. That was worth a little bit more than it is now. But as soon as we fixed the paperwork, they got money immediately and then they got more money the following year. So it worked out. So again, even some of you guys that might have kids in school, you can pay attention to this and take a look at this. So hold up. Just so we're talking about twelve thousand dollars a year in savings, correct? Yeah, and they were. To, <coughs> I don't mean to minimize it. They were going to San Diego State, so San Diego State, 14, 14, 15 years ago, wasn't super expensive. That covered about all of the tuition and about two thirds of the kids' living expenses. And I mean, dude, straight up cried in my office. He was like, dollars of savings, yeah." Yeah. I mean, he, he was just like, oh my God, dude, like I want to hug him. I'm like, please don't like really work. We're, we're good. You can just tell me. And he's like, he's choked up because he's like, I was ready to pull my kid home. I'm like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, dude, you made it honest, like easy mistake to make because paperwork sucks. And I'm like, let's fix it right here. Change that, change that, go home and tell me what happens. Um, I don't think my computer was working that day or something. So we couldn't log in and do it for him. And he called me the next day. He's like, Ron, they gave me, like, I called him up, fixed the paperwork, told him what happened. They gave me that 5,800 right on the spot. Boom, right here. And then our state has a grant to pay for tuition. He had missed the cutoff for it. Um, it was totally on hand before we'd ever met, but we were able to get it for the kid for the following year. So again, like this stuff's real. So I've tried to, like I said, kind of beat you guys up with these examples because I know it's easy to be like, right, whatever. We make too much money. It's not going to work for us. Um, a buddy of mine died a few years ago. He left his wife a bunch of life insurance. Actually, I'm doing a case like this right now with another widow. And um, they have two girls at Stanford. We got 50 something thousand a year. She has a really nice house, a condo on the beach. Uh, not, it wasn't the first lady that I showed you and her, and her husband took his life a couple of years ago. Well, there's a plenty of assets, but we were able to work with the school to not count those legally again, Warren Buffett way. And so whether it's my buddy's wife right here, this new lady that I'm helping, this guy's kids didn't go to Stanford. They went to a local state school at another state school and, but her kids are going to Stanford. And we're getting a hundred thousand a year. She's got twins. We're getting for them again, all above board. So different circumstances calls for different applications of the rules. Same with taxes. But the point is that it can be done. Um, oh, I'm going to just chime in. Oh, go ahead, man. Jump in. And we might talk about this later, but you know, so, and you know, I was just talking to your buddy, um, Lou Brown the other week. Yeah, about Street smart Lou Brown. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some strategies here where, you know, we may, you know, especially as we start looking at unique entity structures and maybe some trust for some of our clients, this is just another example where we can we can take and we don't have to report assets on the FAS on on the FASBA and we can sorry, FAFSA. I was thinking FASBA but the counting um but the FAFSA or not as bad if you're in the middle of the right? It gets all screwed up. Yeah, and other added little bonus opportunities here in asset protection and tax savings under certain scenarios. 100%. Which, by the way, Mark, goes to Dave's question about, look, man, I got these little kids. Dave, good for you for being early, by the way. Most of my people come to my classes. They're like, yeah, my kid's a senior. I have a lot of time to work on this, right? I'm like, no. Oh. Um, I would, the last place that I would put money is the 529. And again, I know it's like, but that's, well, that's what the Edward Jones guy or the Merrill Lynch told me. So let me explain. Number one, it's a single use asset. Yes, Congress says if you don't use it, 
you can turn around and use it for, you can make a Roth IRA out of it. But if you read the rules, it's, it has to be there so many years, you can only convert a portion of your typical Congress. Hey, rather than be like, everybody can switch it. They're like, well, we don't want people putting money that can contribute to 529s. I mean, to Roth IRAs, putting the money in here. So we're going to put all these stupid rules with it. Um, I would look at trust strategies. I would look at Roth IRAs for your kids because they don't count against you in the formula and they can withdraw the principal and then leave the interest behind. I would look at, this is going to sound weird, but Mark already said it. It's not my fault. Blame him. Yeah. If you set it up properly, cash value life insurance, don't hang up. Watch Steve to make sure he doesn't hang up. Um, then let him out. It, it, there are some advantages. And as a tax professional myself, when that concept was introduced to me, I thought the guys who introduced it to me for three years, I'm like, no, it's a scam. Everybody knows it's a scam. After three years, I'm like, you guys are right. I'm wrong. I have to alter my practice. Um, trust strategies are great. So there are, it'd be more of an individual question, Dave, for Mark, but just know that there's strategies that are better available. Um, what should we do? Also, uh, we'll talk at the end about the procedures to to further evaluate and, and how we can yeah. examine it. Yeah. I, who knows where Encinitas is, and um, and if you know the area, I live, like I said, right off 78 and 5, but on the crawls outside of my office is the 5 Freeway is right there and Palomar Park Road is right there. I'm like just west of it, so the ocean's right there. Um, Kyle, if you have fairly sizable 529s, I actually have a ninja trick for those that I have not taught Mark yet. So you work out a time to get with Mark. I'll work out a time to get Mark what to do. We tested it on a buddy of mine two years ago. And I'm like, holy shit, it worked. <laughs> hey, man, he wants to know what's fairly sizable. I don't know, man. I'm going to let you guys com compare that later. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. You'll have to, Dave, you'll have to ask. I think you could private message Kyle if he wants to know. And she can tell you. But it's all, man, I'm I'm out of that conversation. I'm just closing the chats down. But you might have two like lines competing on the sizes of their 420, yeah. 520, 529s. This could be intense. Right? <laughs> you got to keep it. We got to keep it family friendly here, boys. All right. So check it out. If any of you guys golf, I'm in Carlsbad. Every freaking golf manufacturer known to man is headquartered right there. Wait, right in the business park, right on the other side of the freeway. Titleist, Callaway, uh, Wang or Ping, Ashworth, all those guys are right here. So I have a ton of their golf executives as claim, which is hilarious because I'm in finance, tax, and I don't play golf. So they're always coming at me like, hey man, you want a discount on clubs? And I'm like, uh, no, I'm good. But so all these guys get paid like 150 to 200,000. It just depends on their commission. So this guy had you know, big AGI stocks over a hundred, a rental property that had equity was making money. Gonzaga gave him 18,000. You can see the front free money right here, but check this out. Um, they gave his other kid at USC more than they gave my kid, which made me all seven kinds of mad. They gave her 40,000 in gift aid. And there's the USC thing right there. So again, this is real. Don't dismiss this. There's a whole bunch of special circumstances that you should just chat with Mark about, including your very sizable, manly 529s, Kyle. <laughs> uh, and then the last step here, and they're absolutely bigger than Dave's 529, but his kids are smaller. So anyway, um, last thing here, well, before the two half things is you can appeal an award. So remember, it's a formula, right? A process. We got our EFC as well as possible. We did our research. So we knew what they were supposed to give us. We filled the forms out, but they were based on two years back. So now if a school just straight up stiffs you, you can ask like, Hey, you know, before we even applied, we, we did some research and this isn't what the research showed us. They make mistakes. Sometimes, I mean, the truth may be brutal. Sometimes I'm like, we kind of barely let your kid in here. I've had that happen. Not often, but it's happened a couple of times. Um, or another school gives more 
so you can appeal on Cornell's award letter. They were like, if you get a higher award from an Ivy League school, please let us know. They're giving them 73000 71000 something like that. They're like, let us know. We'll change that and we'll see what we can do and see if we can understand their formula and match it. Um, or if you had a change in circumstances, you know, business gets messy, particularly for people in real estate, right? You guys know that can get ugly fast sometimes. Loss of a job, you get married, you get divorced, you got a one-time spike in income, you, you know, got an inheritance with a lawyer once when some massive, you know, personal injury case, his kids, one was at Notre Dame, one was at a fancy private school out here. And we just explained to him like, look, this is a one-time spike. You know, my client worked on this case for years, had tons of expenses. So yeah, he's got this spike to his income, but he has to pay back a lot of the debt that he racked up that doesn't really show on the return. And both schools left his award alone. So you can negotiate that. Um, and that lady right from the start had a great year where like her income went up a couple few hundred thousand from real estate. We just documented and showed the school like, look, this, this for early part of the year, we're like dying here. Yeah, we had a great year. Both schools, Wesleyan and Washington University in St. Louis, were like, we get it. I think Wesleyan took like a thousand bucks away. They're like, look, lady, we have to take something away, but we get it. You know, we'll give you all the money, 42,000 instead of 43. And Washington University is like, we don't even care. Don't bother. You know, we get what happened. So just know that it can be done. Um, so um, anyway, Duke Duke has this weird fetish with property. If, they, if you got property, they think, oh, you can afford the whole thing. So we had a guy who um, was a doctor and his wife was a teacher at my kid's high school. And he owned the building that his practice was in, but it was leveraged out. You know, he didn't have any equity in it. He had just inherited his mom's house. It was in Laguna, but like in a bad part of Laguna, like the inland Laguna. And it was this dumpy community, you know, not like his mom lived in the slum or anything, but it was just an old community. The values didn't stay high. And then he had the house he lived in. So they were like, no, you have all this real estate. We went back and documented what each piece was actually worth. Check this out. They went from giving the kids 6,000 a year to 26,000 thousand a year. Now they give him a hundred bucks. So technically it was a nineteen thousand nine hundred dollar a year increase for asking and explaining and properly documenting what's solved. So that's really kind of you know what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Now this is the half step. And Mark, your guys, this is going to apply to a lot of your clients. Where if they're showing more than $180,000 of income, some of the credits that they might get are um, taken away from them. There is a workaround that's legit that you can use to write off college. So it saves the average parent about ten or $12,000 a year. That's the five, fifth and a half step. The fifth and three quarter step, which is the other half step, but we'll call it a quarter step, is... If you're well above that rate, you know, above 180, the other thing to keep in mind is your need-based state begins to go down, but your merit aid goes up if your kids take the board scores. So we've kind of gone through this revolution where for the last few years, everyone's like the SAT and ACT, you know, are not going to take for whatever reason. They're discriminatory, they're racist, they're ableist because, you know, they sued here in California to have them excluded. Um, during the pandemic because someone with a health condition can go, which is kind of funny because they kept canceling them. So really nobody could go get up. But this is an area, particularly Dave, you've got younger kids. Like when they're in mid end of middle school, beginning of high school, start having your kids prep 15 minutes a day, three or four days a week, because it is a test that can be taught. The skills as well as the taking of the test and we have clients that make four, five, six, eight hundred thousand at one point two a year, where we're saving about twelve to fifteen thousand a year in, on their taxes by the way we pay for college, and then we're getting another ten to twenty in free money from Merit Aid. Well, you add that up, that's net money. 
So a guy making 1.2 or 800 or 500,000, if you live in a high tax state like I do, you you got to make double what you want to give the college because the tax guys are going to eat it. So you get, you know, $15,000 a year in tax savings and another 20 in free merit money. That's like having to go work and make another 60 or 70 to pay for this. So those are kind of your two bonus stuff. Pardon? Okay. Um, let me show you, this is kind of your recap right here. Just what we covered. Oh, last one. New ad, new ad in the business is be prepared for them to just make you document stuff. If you're getting the need based state, not merit, not the tax stuff, but if they are giving you need based state, they may want to document, they call it an audit, but it's not like a real audit. It's like, fill out this form, give us a tax form. We're all good. Um, this is the reason that I would tell you to talk to Mark. If you go into the Googles, and I did this three years ago, but it makes the point, and you just Google how to pay for college, you get 3.4 billion results in half a second. Now, if I did it now, it'd probably be more like 10 billion, 15, I don't know. So if you turn around and do that, you the difference is we live in an information age you can find information endlessly what is unique is insight because the question is of these 3.4 billion pages what are the three or four or five that tell you what you need to be doing in your situation and that's where we can shave a lot of that time off for you by you just sitting down explaining your situation and then us expanding on the workshop you know, Dave or Kyle or anybody else that's looking at this and be like, right, these sizable 529s, they're, they're in your situation. You're one of the few they won't count against you. Leave them alone. Or no, they are going to hurt you, Kyle. Let's do this. Here's option number one. Here's option number two. Here's option number three. Dave, you got these two cute little kids, right? And they're still cute at three and five years old. Less cute when they're 14 and 15. And then they're great again when they're adults, by the way. But hey, let's not keep bouncing money to these 529s for all of these reasons. Let's do this or this or this instead. So the insight to know what applies to your situation is really invaluable. So Kyle, for every client that I have move a 529, I have another one exempt it and I have another one leave it alone, you know, but occasionally we'll take a tax hit because I genuinely believe we will get substantially more dollars by doing that. And I have yet to be wrong on that. So again, and I'll just claim off the wazoo where I'll be like, Woodfriend, I can't guarantee you anything, but let me show you what these schools normally do. Let me show you why this piece is in the way. So yeah, we give a couple grand to the IRS that we wouldn't have to, but we get 15 grand or 12 grand or nine grand a year over here that's tax-free, we come out way ahead. That's the difference and that's why you wanna reach out to Mark on this. I'll let you lay down the house rules, Mark, in a second. But um, this cracks me up. So this guy's Chad, it's actually kind of stats. So you guys can look this up, his name's Chad Alberai. Have you ever seen this before, Mark? Yeah, I remember you talking about it, actually, yeah. Freaking Chad Albright. <laughs> if Chad didn't make bad decisions, Chad would make new decisions. Because Chad led the country back in 2019. Actually, I think he'd gone a couple of years earlier. You guys ready for this? I swear to God, look this up. It's in there. He fled the country and went to China to avoid his student debt. Remember in early 2020 what happened in China? Then he left China. I, you can't even make this up. He went to Ukraine. He went to freaking Ukraine to avoid paying on his student loans. So first of all, Chad doesn't even know that much. Chad owns like less than a, you know, junky car practically. Now he probably owes more because he hasn't been paying for a long time. His original debt wasn't that much. Don't do this. Don't put your kids in this situation. You know, just reach out to Mark, message him in the portal, pop him an email. If you stump him, I know the answer. Can't stump me. Although actually a client stumped me yesterday with some, but it was kind of technical. So I'm still working on the answer for him. Um, but definitely like reach out. And if your kids are already in college, great. 
bring what you did, show them what you did. We'll see if you did it right. The odds are you didn't. And, and that's great because we can fix it and get you more money, hopefully. If you've got a kid that's in high school, you're kind of in the red zone. You want to get started right away. And for guys like you, Dave, where you got the little kids, come in. I do a quick consult. If you're already working with them on some other stuff, great. Keep at it. And then we'll make sure you're not putting money in a place that, that could potentially penalize you later. Um, is there a, Kyle, you're very welcome, by the way. Mark, is there anything else you wanted to share tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's also, you know, when you dive deeper into this, because we don't have enough time to go into all the different ingress, the in all the different idiosyncrasies. Uh, I got you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you know, there's all these actions that you can perform. For instance, uh, if both the kids are going to school at the same time, it reduces your EFC and it gets you to qualify for more aid. It, when you evaluate when there's multiple parents that could potentially have custody, you can create some opportunities. There's so many ways, just like with our tax planning, there's so many ways we, we can look at this to optimize the situation for the children. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, you know, one of the wonderful strategies you talked about earlier, hire the kids, give the kids the Roth. How about this? You put your kid in the business and you make them do something that they're actually going to build upon their greatest strengths. So you, you capital, if they're great at photography, you have them do photographs of your portfolios and you can word this in a way in your college essays to maybe get them some, some more favorable conditions in the college applications. Uh, so there's just, there's a lot to this here. And when we, when we started considering these strategies and, and where we're taking the firm, uh, we decided that instead of mass producing tax plays and talking about cost segregation until our heads fell off, we decided to expand and incorporate all these opportunities because our clients can really use this stuff. And here's a way that we can, uh, really provide so much valuable, valuable insight to so many of our clients in a way that other people can't and align this with your tax strategy, asset protection strategy, and potentially your state playing. So it's just such a wonderful opportunity. I'm, I'm really grateful for you, Ron, to My share pleasure. this with us and to, 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 to train us and our team to deliver these opportunities. Um, we have turned down tons and tons of business so we, I had the bandwidth to build out this side of our consulting. And as far as next steps, as Ron said, uh, we're going to prioritize our clients. Uh, and it's going to be basically a first in, first out for our current clients and the longest lasting clients. We're also helping out some of our internal staff on these strategies. And then if you are approaching us just for the strategies, we're going to have an intake form as well. And the first step, you just message me, fill out that intake form for us as soon as you can so we can evaluate everything and get back to you and start for, start putting together a plan. 100% what he said. And again, I tried to just hammer you guys with example after example. So because I teach these live and I can see people coming in like, yeah, this is a, you know, like this doesn't apply to me. I make too much money or I own too much real estate. And the truth is no. The people, the messier your situation is, you know, the, the more complicated, the better we can do. So I say you reach out to the man as far as it depends on me. That's what I do. But anyway, is there anything, do we have any other questions here? I don't see any. So, so Mark, if I'm good, I'm going to, Oh, whoa, 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 Kyle power sliding in on two wheels at the last second. <laughs> um, so it really GI benefits are great. And again, it's, probably a little better of a one-on-one -on -one conversation depending on what GI benefits you have. So I'd be like, Kyle, just reach out. Um, but they can, so we get in California, uh, we get less GI bills, we get more CalVets, which is a disability benefit. Like you can get kicked, discharged from the military with a 0% disability and that counts. You know, like say you worked on an aircraft carrier and, um, they thought it might impact your future hearing because you were exposed to high decibels over a long period of time. And um, anyway, we so you can we can often use those benefits and then get other benefits to wrap around them if they're not covering the whole thing. So that's where it's really worth having a strategy. And depending on how old your kids are, 
looking at which schools get what and how all that work. So I would be like, again, I'm sorry to give you the politicians. Like I can't really answer it, but it really is like in the tax world. I mean, Mark, how many times a day do you go when a client asks you a question? You're like, it depends because you know, well, can I do this? Well, it depends. So on this, it's just worth reaching out, particularly because you have those very masculine 529s, buff. They work out, they lifted weights, they went to the gym, they play Rocky music. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go. Mark, yeah. Well, it's uh, he's, oh, you know what? And I did assume, by the way, I did that to a client today where I was on his like, she's like, I'm a they, and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see that. All right, just give me a couple times. I apologize for misgendering your 529. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, and you know, this is a good, I think this is a good po uh, stopping point as well. Thank you so much, Ron, for all the insight you've been providing me and my team to to learn more about this stuff and, and create Anytime. opportunities for. Like I said, you're the, you're the point of contact, Mark, but you know where to find me. Just reach out. If anybody reaches out to Mark and you stump him, I'll get the answer. Absolutely. So, we get you guys know what to do. I'm sending the recording to anybody. We had about 30 people register. I'll send them the recordings. And also do, it'll be on my YouTube site, podcast, in case you want to re-listen to some of these concepts. And uh, really looking forward to sharing this with as many people as we can. So thank you again for your time. My pleasure. And, uh, I, I got to go to a birthday party too. So I, I got a flight list in and I got a client. We're trying to get a massive contract where we got to finish up the balance sheet. So I'll be out. Take care, you guys. Have fun at your birthday party, Mark. And let me know when you want to do it again and chat about the other side of the equation, which is the student loan stuff. Awesome. We'll do that. Maybe we'll do that after tax season or something. That'll be good. Take care, you guys.